and welcome to Dining with Death, where we discuss infamous cases of death and murder that have an element of food to them, and then we cook the food from the case. I'm Stacy Lee. Let's begin. Jim Colosimo, born Vincenzo Colosimo, and also known as Big Jim and Diamond Jim, was a major player in the Mustache Pete era of the mob just before Prohibition came into force. In a relatively short time, he built a criminal empire in Chicago based on prostitution, gambling, and racketeering. He started with petty crimes and then headed up a chain of brothels in the city and was soon running what came to be known as the Chicago Outfit. Colosimo was born on February 16, 1878 to Luigi Colosimo and his second wife, Giuseppina Mascaro. As usual, you'll forgive me if I'm mispronouncing names, right? <laughs> Some say Diamond Jim was born in Colosimi in Italy. Others say he was born in Sicily and others say Cosenza, Italy. Some reports say he left Italy when he was 17 years old and emigrated to Chicago. Others say he left Italy with his parents as a toddler. He was really kind of a hustler and hard worker as a kid, and he soon caught the eye of First Ward Alderman Michael Hinky Dink Kenna and Joe Coughlin, who were pretty high up in the chain in Chicago political circles. They made Colosimo a precinct captain, which is kind of a liaison between voters and the heads of political parties. They're in charge of registering voters and making sure citizens have access to absentee ballots, things like that. And through this appointed position, Colosimo met a lot of people that led him to being politically connected. Colosimo was soon given the nickname Diamond Jim because he liked to dress in a white suit and he wore diamond rings and diamond pins and lots of jewelry. He was said to have been a charming man who loved women and money and that's what led him into prostitution and he was very successful in the brothel scene of Chicago. In 1902, Big Jim married Victoria Moresco, who was a madam at a well-established Chicago brothel. After they were married, they joined forces and opened a new brothel, and within a few years, they expanded their business to almost 200 brothels and had branched out into gambling and racketeering operations based in those brothels. Lots of brothel talk in this episode. <laughs> It is said that Big Jim was making $50,000 a month, which is the equivalent of about $155,000 a month today. That kind of criminal under the table income will make you a target for extortion. And by about 1910, Colosimo needed help fending off extortion attempts. He brought in John the Fox Torrio from Brooklyn and made him his right hand man. The Fox was charged with making it known that Colosimo was not to be targeted and he was also in charge of enforcing physical punishment on anyone that tried it. Colosimo expanded his business empire to the restaurant industry in 1909 by opening Colosimo's Cafe, a restaurant and a nightclub located at 2126 South Wabash, which quickly became a very popular place for both Chicago locals and visitors. Colosimo and Torrio opened a brothel next door to the restaurant at 222 South Wabash called The Four Deuces, referencing the address, and Torrio hired his old Brooklyn colleague, a man named Al Capone, to ten bar and work there as a bouncer. And this is how Al Capone gained access to the Chicago outfit that he would one day be running. When Prohibition went into effect in 1920, Torrio pushed Colosimo to get into bootlegging, but Colosimo didn't really want the heat from that illegal business as it was such a large, hot topic and law enforcement was looking for any excuse to lock him up at this point. And this is an important point because it becomes a real bone of contention later on. Colosimo divorced Moresco in 1920 and eloped with Dale Winter. They bought a home on the south side and they moved in together. What Colosimo didn't know is that Torrio and his buddy, Al Capone, had decided that because Big Jim wouldn't get involved in bootlegging, he had to go. On May 11, 1920, Torrio called Colosimo and told him that a shipment was about to arrive at his restaurant. Colosimo drove there waiting for the delivery truck, but instead was ambushed and shot in the head, killing him instantly when he peered out a window door to see if the delivery truck had come. Torrio and Capone had brought in Frankie Yale from New York to kill the mob boss. The Chicago police suspected Yale, but he was never charged. I always get lots of comments on my mob episodes, which I love, about who killed who and who did what, and I realize there are always 
very different theories on who the actual hitmen are in these murders. But keep commenting, keep bringing that to me and letting me know. And you know, when we update things and when we revisit things, I will make sure to include the information that you guys give me. There are also people that believe Colosimo's ex-wife, who was unhappy with the financial arrangement from the divorce, took part in the murder. The problem with the theory that Big Jim was murdered because he wouldn't participate in prohibition is that there is evidence that he had in fact approved a scheme to open some underground breweries and make illegal beer. Sometimes in these power struggles in the mob, they come up with reasons as to why someone's killed, but sometimes they just want him gone so they can take over. You know, there doesn't always have to be a reason. Big Jim is a popular character in pop culture. He's portrayed as Big Louie Castillo in the 1932 gangster movie Scarface, The Shame of a Nation. He is also portrayed by Joe DeSantiago in the movie Al Capone, which came out in 1959. And he is portrayed by Frank Campanella in the movie Capone from 1975. Characters based on Colosimo also appear in the Young Indiana Jones Chronicles and in HBO's Boardwalk Empire. I loved Boardwalk Empire. <laughs> I'm sure a lot of you guys did too. <laughs> Big Jim was really important in this criminal world because perhaps without even knowing it, he really kind of gave birth to the Chicago mob, which like I said was ultimately run by Al Capone. After his murder, Big Jim was given a lavish funeral with a mile long procession led by brass bands. It featured tens of thousands of flowers. His pallbearers included three judges, eight aldermen, a U.S. congressman, and the director of the Chicago Opera. His big casket left his mansion at 3156 South Vernon Avenue and was taken to his final resting place at Oakwood Cemetery. Because he had been divorced, he was not allowed a burial site in a Catholic cemetery. I guess that answers my question as to how he was able to be involved in illegal activity so openly for so many years, you know, it's just all about who you know. Let's talk a little bit about Colosimo's restaurant. It was opened and closed several times, sometimes by authorities for violating prohibition laws and other times to change management. The family sold the restaurant to manager Michael Potson after Diamond Jim's death. He ran the restaurant until about 1940 and then it started to kind of go downhill after Potson was sued by comedy duo Abbott and Costello over a gambling dispute. I definitely need to know more about that story. <laughs> That sounds like a very interesting and kind of a bizarre story. <laughs> Popson was then indicted for gambling by the FBI. In 1953, the restaurant was seriously damaged by a fire. A church renovated the building and used it for services until 1958. But then the city condemned the building and it had to be destroyed. That was the end of Colosimo's restaurant. I was only able to find a single copy of the menu from Colosimo's, and as you can see, it is barely readable. After some digital adjusting and some help from my family, I sent it out to different people. I'm like, what do you read here? What do you read here? As you can see, it's very difficult to make out some of these items. But we were able to make out some dishes like lobster a la Newburgh, assorted cold cuts with potato salad, frog's legs, pepper steak, pickled herring, and fried scallops. The restaurant had an extensive drink menu, one of the larger I've seen from this era, which makes sense because like I said, it doubled as a nightclub after hours. So stay with me because right now we are going to make meatballs a la Colombo, food from Colosimo's restaurant, the mob boss, that went by Diamond Jim right now as we go dining with death. We are ready to cook. We're gonna make some fantastic meatballs. I'm not even gonna to pretend to tell you how to make meatballs if you're a meatball maker because everybody has their own little way and everybody has the things that they love. But I am gonna show you a couple of tips and tricks that you might not know about. Maybe you can take them in and make your meatballs even better or maybe you can teach me something. We'll see. I've got a cup of Italian breadcrumbs here. I like to get the Italian ones because they're just a little bit more seasoned and I found a brand that I really like the seasoning in. They smell really good. I always soak my breadcrumbs in a little bit of milk. So there's a little tip. If you're not already doing that, it can make a big difference. I use my hands with everything that has to do with meatballs or meatloaf. It's getting mixed with my hands. Just wet those with the milk, and now you're gonna set those aside and let them soak while we work with the other ingredients. Into our bowl goes a pound of ground beef, a half a pound of ground pork, 
and a half a pound of Italian sausage that we're gonna remove from the casings. If you ever come across a meatball recipe that only calls for one kind of meat, run screaming from that recipe. Meatballs need different kinds of meat and they need a high fat meat mixed in with some lower fat meats for texture. I'm gonna break down one white onion and I'm gonna mince this thing so fine. If I was at the restaurant, I would put it in my little pulser and pulse it into kind of a mash, but um, I'm just gonna chop it really, really fine. You don't want big chunks of raw onion in your meatballs. That was a really big onion, so I'm only gonna use about half of it. Okay, you're gonna add your onion to your meat. I'm gonna mince up four cloves of garlic and add that as well. Okay, let's add that. I've got two eggs here. We're gonna beat those really well. Let's add those. Need those for binding along with the breadcrumbs. I always add grated Parmesan cheese to my meatballs. That's about a cup, I would say. I also love fresh chopped parsley in my meatballs. I can taste it, it makes a huge difference. Mm, that's one of my favorite smells. I'm gonna add about a quarter cup of that to the meatballs. I'm gonna reserve the rest for garnish. Okay, let's add those soaked breadcrumbs back in. Really break those up as you go, because they will get clumped together and you don't want a big piece of clumpy breadcrumbs in your bite. So we bake the bread, we dry it out, we turn it into breadcrumbs, and then we make it moist again with milk. <laughs> it works better than fresh bread, what can I say? And as with everything, we season. Kosher salt, plenty of it, season. Don't season, season. Black pepper. And now we mix and mix and mix. You can get these things at like the dollar store if you wanna have your kids help you and you're not really sure where their hands have been or how well they've washed. I absolutely hate wearing them, but you know, just for show. <laughs> That's with a lot of things in my life. When I had my restaurant, it was kind of elevated American comfort food and one of our most popular dishes was the meatloaf. And on a weekend, we would go through, probably we would do about 150 to 200 covers on a Friday and a Saturday night. We'd go through 16 to 20 pounds of meatloaf. And whatever chef was late or in trouble, which was always somebody with me, <laughs> they had to mix the meatloaf. The bowl was about four times the size and your hands would just be freezing cold by the time you were done mixing it. It was really a miserable job. But there's only one way to mix meatballs and meatloaf, like this. Squeezing it through your hands like you're making sausage. It's the only way. You gotta do that squishing motion because that's what makes sure everything's really well incorporated. Okay, it's time to start making little golf ball sized meatballs. If you want the big giant meatballs, that's a different recipe. This is for little golf ball sized meatballs. Okay, we have got ourselves a gorgeous tray of meatballs here. Now, how do we cook them? 
I like a combination of the two methods. A lot of people will put them in a pan and brown them and that's it. And a lot of people will put them in a pot of sauce and boil them and that's it. I like a combination of both. I brown them on the outsides. I don't finish them off in the oil though. And then I drop them in the sauce and let them simmer until they're finished. For me, it's the best of both worlds. You get a little bit of texture on the outside and then they're soft and creamy on the inside. They're just perfect. Okay, I've got my favorite heavy bottomed old skillet here and I've just put olive oil in the bottom of it. We're gonna wait for that to get hot. We're gonna do these in batches. So set yourself a clean plate aside because you're gonna do a few at a time and set them off to the side. You don't wanna get that oil too cold, that pan too cold, and you're not gonna be able to do them all at the same time. Okay, let's start dropping these. Okay, when you've got a nice crust on that first bat, you pull them out and let's do the second. Aren't these cute? We've got a great big plate of really rustic hand-rolled meatballs here. I love the way these look. You give me a perfectly round meatball. I'm not interested, it's gonna be like a sponge. This is some really good homemade tomato sauce. Now, if you can't do your own tomato sauce, what I would prefer that you do, rather than just doing jarred sauce, is get the really good Italian tomatoes that are canned at the, kind of the peak of freshness and puree those in a blender. Add a little tomato paste and some seasonings and kind of make your own little tomato sauce. That's better than just using it out of a jar. But you know what? If you need to use the stuff out of a jar, honey, do whatever makes your life easy. Let's get that warm. Now, remember, these aren't cooked all the way through. They're just brown. So you have to do this step in this particular recipe. We're gonna drop these in the sauce and we're gonna let them simmer for, I don't know, at least 30 minutes for me. Just let that sauce really soak into the meatballs. Let them cook all the way through. Don't, don't really boil them. You just kind of want them to simmer and cook and marry the flavors together. Squeeze that last little guy in here. There's always room for somebody else, right? Okay, that is a pot of love. We are gonna bring that up to temp and let that simmer. Okay, I've pulled these off of the heat. I'm gonna let them sit for just a minute, kind of soak up all of that sauce, rest in the sauce just a little bit. I love this dish because it's very rustic and old fashioned and the stuff on the bottom kind of has one texture and flavor and the stuff that has sat on the top kind of has another texture and flavor. It smells so good in here. I wish I could share. Okay, I am gonna plate some of these up and we're gonna taste them. Aren't these gorgeous? They smell incredible. I've got some fresh grated Parmesan cheese here. We're gonna top that. Oh my goodness. I've got the remainder of our chopped Italian flat leaf parsley here. Oof, that looks pretty good to me. I am really excited to taste these, so here goes. Oh, that texture. Those of you that eat a lot of Italian food, you know what I'm talking about. It kind of breaks and gives under the pressure of the fork. There's no spring back. You don't have that bouncy processed texture. They just fall open. Look at that. Yeah, the texture is really nice already without even tasting.
Wow. <laughs> Those are really good. <laughs> this is a recipe I've had for a really long time and it never fails me. I've made a couple of little tweaks to it over the years and sometimes I'll add just a little tiny bit of freshly ground fennel seed. I usually do that if I'm doing like a spicy sausage or something with it, but these are really good meatballs. Steal this recipe, use it, you'll love it. Mm-hmm. They're just garlicky enough. The Parmesan cheese gives it a very rich, velvety quality. The breadcrumbs and the eggs bind everything together, but it remains very moist and very tender. Mm. They're very flavorful and very, very succulent. One last bite. Thank you for joining me today as we made meatballs a la Colombo, food from Colosimo's, the place where Big Diamond Jim was gunned down so many years ago. Like and subscribe if you'd like to see more. Stay safe, be kind to each other, and I'll see you next time on Dining with Death. Bye.